Hey there, and welcome back to XCOM 2. My name is Pete, and today we complete another episode of our Legend Iron Man walkthrough of XCOM 2 War of the Chosen. Last time we left off after defeating the Berserker Queen in combat, which did actually unlock an achievement which I simply forgot to edit into the episode. So here it is, Berserker Breaker now unlocked, achievement number 46 of this playthrough. And with that, we really don't have much else to do but to begin scanning. But before we even get a chance to, it's time for another set of Gorilla Ops. This one immediately following the extra one we got last episode. This time, however, we have the full set of three to choose from. The new Arctic mission then already sounds intriguing, only 10 enemies and we would get an engineer out of it. The Advent Loot Sit Wrap is a nice bonus on top. The only problem is that I don't really think the Dark Event is worth countering and that we would most likely also run into the Assassin. The West Asia mission then I think we can safely ignore. Supplies we have enough at the moment and the loyalty among Thieves Dark Event is really no threat at all. And so I think it's going to be Eastern Europe countering the Infestation Dark Event which has caused us some trouble before. And at this stage of the game acquiring another scientist is also a bit more useful than acquiring another engineer. Unfortunately though we don't have any beneficial sit wraps and also 13 enemies, some of them are quite powerful. Still I think picking this mission is the right call in this situation. Setting course for Eastern Europe. For our squad then we are going Reaperless and also without any kernels. Instead a Ranger Mick will lead the squad and Bond mates Mox and Nicholas also get a taste of action. Mox in particular is starting to lag behind a bit. Let's see if this mission perhaps can change that. Ranger deployed. Squad green to deploy. We've been picking up unusual readings coming from this area, and our recon team has confirmed that Advent is now operating some sort of massive psionic transmitter nearby. Shen and Tigan agree, if we destroy the transmitter while it's still connected to Advent's network, their operations across this entire region could be crippled. Advent has constructed a psionic transmitter in this area, tied directly into their primary network. Our intel suggests destroying it while it's still connected will severely damage their linked systems. Plant the explosives before they have a chance to pull the plug. Right, so a rather simple objective here, we just need to plant some X4 charges on the psionic transmitter. However, to get us started we only have 4 turns to do so. We can extend that timer by blowing up power relays in the vicinity, but let's not do so too early as that would break concealment. We have also just detected our first two enemies, a shield bearer and an advent officer, as well as the first power relay. Our readings indicate that relay is feeding energy directly into their network. If you can destroy it, it may disrupt their efforts to isolate the transmitter. Right, I don't think I need to explain this anymore, but we do want to keep in mind that blowing up these power relays does break concealment. Moving on target location. And at least for the moment we want to get everyone into a good position first. If we can, I would also like to skull mine the advent shield bearer. After all, there is an achievement for skull mining each type of advent soldier. And the shield bearer is still missing on our list. And that means, with our enemies not moving out of sight, we want to be careful how we engage here, as we obviously do not want to accidentally kill the shield bearer. So let's open fire with Mox, but let's target the officer, always keeping in mind that Julian might fire a reaction shot too even if he's not on overwatch. There is no more hiding. And indeed, our spark takes aim, but it looks to me like he's going after the officer. Okay, so far so good, the officer is down to a manageable number of hit points, while the shield bearer has actually come closer, and so we can attempt the skull mine now with Specialist Van Dyke. <laughs> Lovely, that succeeds, everything else is now just a bonus on top and obviously we are going for the 80% chance for some intel. Sadly though that fails, so Van Dyke is going to take some damage. Nicht durch. Das tut weh. 
Right, three points of damage, I think we can live with that, as we now only have the Advent Trooper and Purifier left, as well as one more enemy that I'm not going to spoil at this point. Now, before we engage the officer, let's quickly check with Mig if the coast is clear. And that does indeed seem to be the case, nothing waiting for us deeper in the back here. So let us move in with Julian now and take aim with a 69%er. He might hit it or not, with Julian you really never know. Alright, that's two enemies down, 11 more to go, and it looks like we have just found the next three, as Ranger Mig continues to scout and detects two Archons as well as an Andromedon. And even for us, that is a formidable group of enemies, so let's make sure that we do not draw their attention too early. Ideally, we would start things off with a full round of Overwatches, but unfortunately at this point only Tsunami can activate hers. The enemies then also unfortunately seem to detect us immediately, so let's see who our sharpshooter targets. Right, so that's a miss against the Andromedon, not off to a great start and things do get worse, as we now also have a Codex and a Purifier joining the party. Advent has almost cut off the transmitter from their network. We're running out of time. And yes, to make matters even worse, the timer is also mercilessly ticking down. But before we can worry about that, we have these five enemies to take care of. And while we did bring a Mimic Beacon, I doubt it's going to save us from all of them. So I guess it's time for another one of those turns. Now, to get us started, we'll move Ranger Mig onto the high ground. He is still concealed after all. And this does give us a slightly better view of the battlefield. And with him not detecting any unwelcome surprises, we are then moving in with Grenadier Nicholas, who as a heavy gunner has only brought a single grenade into this mission, but we can now use that grenade to target three enemies and to also blow up one of the power relays. Boom! Well done. As we had hoped, the network separation has been temporarily delayed. Now, the downside of all of this is that we just produced another enemy because of the Codex cloning. And while that clone teleported, I believe we also saw at least one Spectre standing further in the background, so we might not exactly have made things any easier. Nonetheless, we are taking the risk as we move up with Tsunami here. I can handle that. And indeed, that activates two additional enemies, a Spectre and a Muton. So, that's eight active enemies currently on the map, not a fun situation to be in. So let's go to work with a lightning hand shot against the Andromedon. Thankfully the Dark Claw bypasses all of its armor. That's a critical, lovely, and at this point we can follow things up with face off. God knows we have enough targets available. <laughs> Alright, good but not great, at least we get rid of the Codex clone, and at least the first two groups of enemies also look a lot more manageable now. At this point then we continue with a simple shot from Mox against the Archon. And because taking a shot is not turn ending for Mox, we can now follow that up with Saturation Fire, which consumes three points of ammo, but as you can see we can use it to target up to three enemies, and while our hit chances are not great against all of them, at least the Archon should be a kill. The area falls. All right, that is the Archon down, Purifier, Codex and Andromedon meanwhile are all looking rough. Unfortunately though, that's only half of the remaining active enemy force. Stomp, stomp, stomp. So let us move in with Julian now and activate Overdrive. which then allows us to first use his Shredder Gun to take out Codex and Andromedon. I've conceived of every possible way to end you. 
And even though the Andromedon shell is now still standing, we have plans for that. Julian, meanwhile, can focus his attention on striking the Archon. Although, as you can see, I was getting some pretty hefty frame drops at this point. Looks like Julian is always good for a surprise. Now the strike connects, but the frame drops unfortunately persisted, so I had to restart the game, just in case you're wondering why perhaps some of the corpses and environment look different. Ich verleihe dir Stärke. Now, at this point, we're using Van Dyke's teamwork to give Tsunami an extra action. However, before we decide what to do with it, we are using Van Dyke's second action point to hack the Andromedon. Umprogrammierung aktiviert. And while taking control would obviously be nice, we are not taking any risks at this point. Even the shutdown here is still tremendously helpful, as we can now focus all of our attention on the remaining enemies. Now, moving on, I think we have another choice but to reveal Ranger Mig. So let's start things off with an axe throw against the Purifier. The hits, and with that the kill is guaranteed, which means that both Implacable as well as Untouchable will trigger. The axe throw itself also did not cost an action, so we can now activate a run and gun. And we're going to use that to move into a flanking position against the Muton. Now, thankfully, we did not detect any further enemies along the way, and as you can see, we have a guaranteed critical hit against the Muton here. However, before we use it, let's jump back to Tsunami real quick who has a decent chance of eliminating the Archon with her pistol. All she needs to do is not deal minimum damage. Well, all the Archon dodges, that can happen too, of course. Good thing we have not yet ended our turn with our Ranger, as Mig will now use the Serpent Armor's Frostbite ability on the Archon. Even if that fails, chances are the Archon will only use Blazing Pinions, but I would rather not give it that choice in the first place. And indeed, the Frostbite connects and the Archon is frozen solid, which means we can now take out the Muton, leaving only a single Spectre standing. And there we are, that's our turn, let's see what that Spectre now does. Alright, looks like the Spectre is going after our Ranger. And unfortunately, Untouchable does not protect against Shadowbind. Still, this is very much what I had expected to happen when I made plans for this turn. You can pretty much always leave a Spectre alone for at least one round. That is, if you're sure you can take it out afterwards. Alright, and there we are. We have a stunned Andromedon shell, a frozen Archon, a Shadowbound Ranger and a Spectre at full health. And, at least for now, also only two more turns left to plant the X4 charges, but let's take things one step at a time. To begin our next turn here, we can give Van Dyke the high ground and then use Dual Strike, which allows him and his bondmate Tsunami to take a shot at the same target. Crucially though, the shot will be free for our sharpshooter, and both of them have blue screen rounds equipped, which naturally makes the Spectre the perfect target. Lovely, both shots connect and that's the Spectre taken care of. It also drops some loot and Ranger Mig is free from his Shadowbind. And we will actually continue with Tsunami herself now, who can now take a second sniper rifle shot, this time against the Andromedon. That reduces the enemy to 7 hit points and I had planned for Mox to take it out. Unfortunately though, I overlooked that he only has one round of ammunition left. So instead, after reloading, the kill will have to go to Julian instead. After all, he can definitely also make use of the experience points. Do I get a badge or something? Moving on then, we take out another power node with Grenadier Nicholas.
Then we grab the loot with our ranger, recovering two Illyrium cores and an alien data cache. And finally, we use Mick to take out the Archon. His stock will guarantee the kill. Alright, so far so good. And with that, another turn comes to its end. We then detect some movement next to the psionic transmitter, spotting a muton and a gatekeeper. So let's reconceal our ranger and have him scout things out. Unfortunately, that does not really give us a clearer picture. In fact, it actually loses his line of sight of the muton. So we'll spend the turn here just inching a little closer. And of course, Van Dyke moves into the perfect spot to uncover all four remaining enemies, who had unfortunately all been huddled closely together, and all of a sudden we once again find ourselves in a rather tricky situation. Still, this one should be a little easier than the first one. This time we begin things with Julian's Bombard to do some good damage against both of the mutons here. This also blows up the cover of the muton closest to our ranger, and with a 97%er, the kill here is more or less guaranteed. Or we just missed the shot, that's an option too I guess. Let's hope that Grenadier Nicholas gets a bit more lucky against the gatekeeper, as we are now going for the chain shot, but even if that misses, that wouldn't be the end of the world. And it does miss, but again nothing to worry about, at least not yet, because we can now simply give Nicholas teamwork with Mox, and then have him launch his Frost Bomb at Muton and Gatekeeper. Now very importantly, this is not going to shut down the Gatekeeper for the entire turn, it will simply remove one of its actions on the next one. Still, it takes one of the mutons out of the fight, so we might as well keep shooting at the gatekeeper. And with blue screen rounds and armor bypassing, Tsunami's pistol is the weapon of choice. Hard target. Minimal damage. And because once isn't enough, let's take a second shot as well. And we are not done yet, let's give Tsunami yet another charge of teamwork which she can then use to take out the muton we have not yet frozen, at least the one we can actually shoot at, the other one will unfortunately survive this turn unharmed. Impressed yet? And well, looks like we got lucky here with the hat trigger kicking in, so how about we just shoot at the gatekeeper again? If we hit for max damage, that would actually be the kill. Alright, so no kill just yet, and that is unfortunately about all we can do on this turn, so I think it's Mimic Beacon time. We have the Gatekeeper as well as one Muton that get to act on this turn. Let's hope that the Mimic Beacon fools them both. And there you can see it, despite the Frost Bomb the Gatekeeper gets to act. However, it somehow manages to miss the decoy from close range. The Muton then thankfully also seems to take aim and that shot connects. Still, we escape the enemy turn unharmed. And so, cleaning up the remaining enemy force should not be too difficult at this point. Let's begin by once again moving in close with our Ranger. And indeed, we have made it to the transmitter and can now in fact plant the X4 right here now. Doing so does not cost us an action point. The X4 charges are active, but the aliens are still working to isolate the transmitter. Eliminate any remaining hostiles before they cut it off. And I don't think there is any reason to worry about that. Let's finish taking out the last remaining hostiles. With MiG taking out Muton number one, we can then move in Julian, who is guaranteed the kill against number two. And finally, we're using Mox to take out the Gatekeeper. I feel like he did not get to shine as much as I had hoped here today. That 
transmitter is history. Good work, Commander. And there we are, mission complete, two dicey situations solved nicely I think. And apart from those three points of feedback damage on Van Dyke, nobody got injured. Filling 20 minutes of video with a 6 turn mission however, I think that deserves an achievement of its own. Speaking of which, we did not unlock anything here today, but we did complete that very important skull mine on the shield bearer. Again, the unwarranted attacks of the so-called resistance organizations that plague our world have severely damaged critical advent infrastructure, delaying the delivery of valuable food and medicine to the outlying city centers. We ask the elders to watch over all those who will now end up in need. To end the elders' false vision, that is the purpose of all skirmishers. Until it is done, there can be no other path for us. Right, just 7 days injury time for Van Dyke, I think we can live with that. Everyone except for Mig is also tired, but again, nothing to be concerned about here. Our loot then, nothing we haven't been notified of yet, especially the two Illyrium cores will definitely come in handy for our Proving Ground projects. Hello, Commander. And with that, we have countered the Infestation Dark Event, so no surprise chrysalids this time, and we have also recruited Dr. Marcus Sanson, a scientist submitted by patron supporter MJ Tilly. Sanson was a nuclear technician in an American ballistic missile submarine when the aliens attacked. As the US defense network was systematically brought down by the aliens, the submarine began to receive fewer and fewer orders from command. Eventually, the captain decided to launch his missiles at the nearest alien target. Before the sub could launch, something from below attacked the submarine, and Sanson is the only survivor. Very fitting biography for a scientist, so congratulations and welcome to the team. If you want to submit a character of your own by the way, you can do so by following along with a simple video I have linked on screen and down below, but for now let's keep scanning, we have a few more minutes here I think. A rumor for resistance contacts can then safely be ignored, we have everything that we will ever need in that regard. And assorted loot might also sound intriguing, but it is random PCSs and weapon attachments and the chances of those being A useful and B of superior quality are rather slim, so instead let's pay a quick visit to the black market. Avenger plotting new course. After all, we learned in a previous episode that Archon corpses are in high demand and we no longer need ours since we already began the autopsy and they are not used for anything else, so we might as well sell the four we still have for some extra supplies. Moving on then, our next destination is the alloy rumor down here. Avenger plotting new course. To unlock everything we want to acquire, I think we will need a few more than we currently have. continue to make progress on the Avatar project. If we're going to slow them down, we'll need to move fast. One more point of Avatar project progress then should not worry us in the slightest. Instead, let's celebrate the acquisition of our first experimental powered weapon, the Blaster Launcher. This might actually be the best heavy weapon in the entire game, you will most likely see why in the next episode, but it is far from the only powered weapon we can acquire, so let us immediately schedule the next one. Sounds good, Commander. I'll let you know as soon as the project is ready for deployment. In total, there are four, and we want and actually need to grab them all. One more thing we want to do here, since we are coming up on the end of another month, is to upgrade our resistance ring once more. With the Holo Planner, we can unlock yet another slot for resistance orders, and you can never have enough of those. And with that, we can now keep scanning. Our cooperation has proven to be a boon to the Resistance. And there we are, our latest covert action has been completed, we have acquired some intel and Grenadier Typhoon has been promoted to the rank of Colonel. Before we level him up however, let's select the next covert operation and I think it's time to finish hunting the Warlock. Alternatively, we could also increase the combat intelligence and get a promotion for someone, but that actually only makes sense for soldiers who have a decently high combat intelligence in the first place, and we don't really have a lot of those, at least not in positions where I feel like we need the extra promotion. 
So instead, let's make some progress towards actually finishing the game and unlock the Warlock Stronghold, and we'll do so with Grenadier QT, who will therefore join Typhoon at the Colonel rank, and we'll have Ranger Sobierski join her, just to keep our high-ranking personnel free. My followers will lead this action to victory. At this point, we can then take care of Typhoon's promotion, and at the rank of Colonel, Grenadiers get two very interesting abilities, Saturation Fire and Rupture. Now, Saturation Fire we already saw in action earlier with Mox, but the Grenadier version also has a chance to destroy enemy cover, while Rupture is fantastic against strong single targets, delivering a guaranteed critical hit and a damage boost for all follow-up attacks. An obvious choice for the Heavy Gunner Grenadier, but Typhoon is leaning slightly more towards Demo Expert, so let's give him Saturation Fire, QT can then get the other ability once she levels up. And with that taken care of, let's keep scanning for just a little while longer, the end of the month is coming closer after all. But first, we finish constructing, or rather reconstructing, the training center, which means we can now level up the bond between Warhawk and Sapphire West, and hope that we don't require their services for the next six days. Engineer Baron von H has also been freed up and can now head into the infirmary. We don't have a whole lot of injuries at the moment, but it's better than sitting idly around. Strategic resource located. A short while later then, the alien alloys have been collected, 80 of them, a nice haul I think. And with the end of the month coming closer, let's make contact with New Australia now. As you can see, the intel cost has been reduced, we acquired that as a reward a while back, and this will also unlock the continent bonus. Chosen Warlock is hard at work for his masters in this area. And indeed, our monthly income has been increased by 60 supplies, and yet another continent bonus is unlocked, although if possible I would of course prefer not to send anyone out who is wounded. Still, it's another step on the path to full completion, and this next one here is too, as we are now building a radio relay in New Mexico. Setting course for Sector 8, Mexico. Of course we want to grab the North American continent bonus too. not think I could have predicted this outcome, though it is intriguing. It certainly is impressive looking, if nothing else. Although I am still not entirely sure what the aliens hope to achieve with such a grand design. Alright, and we have completed the Archon Autopsy, and you can now probably also see why. It unlocks the final tier of upgrades for all of our melee weapons. So we can now manufacture the Fusion Axe, an axe that is guaranteed to set enemies on fire, the Fusion Ripjack, which boosts the skirmish's melee damage to a respectable 8 points, and the Fusion Blade, which just like the axe will set enemies ablaze. The Berserker Autopsy is now also instant, so that's what we'll do next, and afterwards we will then most likely follow up with the inspired alien data cache decryption. This fearsome creature, long referred to as a Berserker, is clearly a genetic relation to the other mutant species we have encountered in the field. For reasons yet unknown, this particular variant is unique in that it is altogether consumed by what can only be described as blind rage, a thirst for combat, unlike any other creature we've encountered. As if the typical muton wasn't aggressive enough, this hulking beast seems dangerous even in death. I will be more than happy to dispose of it once I file my report. Right, not as much new stuff with this one, we just unlock Overdrive Serum, a single-use item that boosts the user's movement range and gives them 5 points of armor. Personally, I haven't found it to be that useful, but the movement range increase has its uses, perhaps we'll see one of them at some point soon. Either way, for now, let's keep going with the data cache, as this will give us some much-needed intel. I will send word as soon as we have something of note. And with that, let's continue scanning. The end of the month report is due in just a second here. Got an urgent communication coming in for you now, Commander. 
Your progress against the aliens over the past month has been significant, Commander. But there is still room to improve if we are going to eliminate the alien threat. Okay, so the Council could be happier. Not quite sure why, to be honest. After all, we have done a fantastic job this month. The Warlock then gains the All-Seeing Strength, which could actually be some trouble, because it reveals Reapers and thus disables Banish, for which you need to be in concealment. A small problem perhaps, but something we should keep in mind. The Chosen then planning their actions again, as usual, the Assassin prepping for another sabotage, while the Warlock has initiated a fourth Dark Event, so let's take a look at those next. Loyalty among Thieves and Viper Rounds we already know from last month, both are acceptable I think. The Collectors is also alright and can actually be used against the Chosen somewhat reliably, while Signal Jamming might be problematic depending on how much scanning we're doing next month. I'm not entirely certain if it also affects the construction time of radio relays, but I'm afraid it does. So that would probably be the one to counter, while with our recently unlocked Resistance Order slot we are now once again activating Popular Support 2. The extra funds could come in handy, and yes, there might be an argument to be made in favor of scavengers too, but I have a feeling that we will spend a good chunk of the next month actually building radio relays, so that one might be more useful the month after that. And with that, we collect our paycheck and I think we have reached a good point to make the cut for today. In the next episode, I am actually planning to launch the Forge mission, depending of course on whether or not the aliens have anything else planned for us, but I think we should start making some progress again, and that mission definitely helps in that regard. So, let's wrap things up right here. As always, I hope you enjoyed the episode, and if you did, then I would be very happy if you could leave a thumbs up. If you like what I'm doing and want to support me and my channel further, then you can of course also go ahead and subscribe to stay up to date, grab some merch over on shop.peatcomplete.com, or check out and maybe even pledge to the Pete Complete Patreon. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.